My name is Robin Dorman, Executive Director of Aracha Animal International, an arts advocacy animal rights organization. The arts allow us a powerful imaginative seeing and resistance. It's a passageway showcased so gorgeously by our extraordinary panelists. This is our second live streamed event, and I want to express my deepest gratitude to everyone taking part today. In May, our launch event, not only was a renowned Annie Potts in attendance, who I'm delighted to say is today's host, but also in attendance making a cameo in the middle of her living room, her head resting on a bright red comfy pillow, was Esther the Wonder Pig, who, like Robert Frost's secret, sat in the middle and knew, and like the diva she was, sometimes in colorful wig wigs, hats, jewelry, perhaps most exuberantly, she showed the world who pigs are. Hilarious, stunningly smart, huge-hearted, outrageously joyous, when given the opportunity. Something else she knew was to greet her devotees around the world with that million-dollar smile. Every day, how much that meant to so many, and along the way, Esther devotees made decision to never eat pigs again. This luminous presence transfigured lives. She knew how to live and inspired even the most obstinate to make a shift. As Steve said, this is what happens when you fall in love with a pig. The world fell hard. Esther will always remind us to let pigs, sheep, goats, cows, chickens, octopuses, ducks, and every other divine individual use for food to live in the way they're meant to, the freedom to be themselves. Here's to the memory of the beautiful, loving Esther we will never forget. And now I hand it over to the great Annie Toss. Thank you so much, Robin. And I want to also thank Carl, who is our producer. Um, and a uh, big shout out to him because uh, this has been a mega technical event and I'm personally very uh, technophobic. He's making it happen, so thank you. And of course, the wonderful animal activists and artists who are part of um, today's um, event. I also want to welcome the audience out there too. Thank you so much for joining us today. We wouldn't be doing it without you. So unfortunately though, um, one of the artists, Yvette Watt, is unable to join us today. Um, Yvette is a fantastic artist, but unfortunately she has caught a virus. So we're one down, but we've still got eight fabulous um, artists as part of this event. So I hope you can understand my accent. Uh, I come from Aotearoa, New Zealand, where we tend to shorten words. So what will happen is that um, we don't actually present, uh, pronounce our R's like everybody else. So where a lot of people might say art, and that's your Americans out there and Canadians as well, art. I say art. So I hope that you can understand me when I'm talking about art. So before we begin, I also want to acknowledge the impact that Esther had on the world and pass on my condolences to her human Steve and Derek. And I want to take a moment to honour the life and the uh, lifelong work of um, Karen Davis, who was the president of United Poultry Concerns, uh, who passed away very recently. Dr. Karen Davis was a trailblazer in the area of um, avian advocacy. She advocated for birds all over the world, and particularly for those who are incarcerated and bred and slaughtered in their billions every day from their consumption. Karen was a great mentor to me, um, and she will be very, very missed. Um, Karen, she also promoted compassion, consumption, which a lot of our artists do today, probably all of them, in fact, and everyone involved with this project. Um, so rest in love, Karen. Uh, your legacy is immense and it's ongoing. Today's event is Paul, Revealing Hidden Worlds, Art Advocacy and Animals. And the title itself tells us quite a bit about advocacy and art, it's about exposing what is routinely and deliberately concealed. So we're talking about the hidden worlds of the mega corporations that make meat, dairy and egg across the world. We talk about big pharma, university laboratories, zoos, um, 
animal entertainment industries, including horse and dog racing, and of course many other institutions and practices that exploit animals predominantly for profit. Once people's eyes are open to the hideous lives and deaths of people's, uh, sorry, well, people, yeah, animals who are caught up in these corporations, it's much harder to turn away. Uh, once you know something, it's much harder to unknow it. So animal advocacy through art is all about raising awareness about animal exploitation. It's also about disrupting boundaries that might taken for granted about human exceptionalism or human supremacy and it's about the use about sort of like disturbing these ideas we have about using and consuming other species importantly it can also be about imagining and manifesting worlds in which human animal relationships are different not based on the current domination and control that humankind exerts on other species but maybe even worlds where compassionate Coexistence can exist. I teach courses in human animal studies at the University of Canterbury, and I come from a specifically uh, political perspective called critical animal studies. It's always deeply politicised. It's about topics that um, cover power and control of humans over animals, other people, and the environment. One of the reasons I was so excited to host this event when Robin asked me to, is that I'm personally absolutely in awe of activist art and what other forms this might take. Because I have witnessed personally the transformation of attitudes towards animals as a result of art, not just attitudes, um, but students often seek to then kind of align their, um, their change in attitudes or beliefs to their practices, their behaviours. Um, Maybe not big at first, little jumps first, but they're on a journey. Several of the artists featured in this event are prominent teachers in my courses, but they may not know that. Um, and it's through their art that students' beliefs and practices have changed or have begun to change. The old saying, a picture paints a thousand words, is spot on for animal advocacy. Whether the picture that has been painted or is right in front of you is an actual painting or a sculpture, whether it's an illustration in a book or an animation in a video or it's a performance or it's imagined in literature, or poetry or some other artistic medium. Activist art inspires critical thinking. And perhaps most of all, it inspires emotions. Emotional aspects of activist art are often key to my students' transformations. I think this is very much the case when there's something that you find out about is revealed or expressed in art. Sometimes knowing, finding out about something through art, um, it can occur gently or it can occur in a more provocative or graphic way. One of the most effective photographs I use in my classes shows a solitary male chick just hatched, the last individual in his group of new hatchlings to go down the chute for shoot to be macerated. Male chicks are redundant in an industry that profits from hens laying eggs. They're not needed and they're immediately killed upon hatching. And we're told that uh, this kind of, you know, uh, macerating blades method is the most humane. The photograph also shows um, the exploited uh, people behind um, this kind of work. So low-paid workers, often immigrants um, in the United States, preparing to shut down the conveyor belt after this final chicken is killed for the day. This photo has provided both a provocative and a gentle way into teaching students about the egg industry. Context is everything. Some students at first think the image is cute until the context is explained. The conversation this photograph has generated in my classes reflects students' new awareness of the egg industry. They have an enormous emotional response once they know what's happening to this lone male chick destined to meet the same fate as the thousands who have gone before him that day. 
And this is accompanied by a desire to intervene and to save him. This is what they say in their discussions. So having experienced how art can change mindsets from behavioural changes and benefit non-human animals, I feel very, very humbled to be in the presence of these amazing artists presenting today. And I also be very honoured to help guide today's conversations. Now, how this will work um, is that I'm going to introduce each artist uh, in turn, and then they will talk for a few minutes about uh, their art and animal activism. Then we'll, we're going to move through the artist presentations um, before we open this up to questions, uh, Q&A. And um, I'll also have uh, sort of um, mediated discussion between the artists on some topics that we've um, come up with. So uh, it's now my great pleasure to meet the first of our panellists, um, my very good friend Ava Marie Lindahl from Sweden. Ava Marie is a visual artist and a researcher um, based in Sweden whose artistic projects were informed by both critical animal studies and animal activism. Ava Marie's project focused on the writing of art history itself. Specifically, she challenges patriarchal and anthropocentric aspects of art history by correcting, rewriting, and imagining new art histories. Now, Ava Marie really kindly sent me a copy of her sensational, well, their new books, really, is one. Um, Challenging Anthropocentrism Through Counter-Art Histories and Non-Human Narratives. And look at this beautiful one, which she's kindly given me, Resistance Within, whoops, can't do the mirror thing in the, um, oh, oh. <laughs> oh God. Uh, it's called Resistance Within the Museum Format. I'm no good at the mirror thing. So anyway, these books are based on uh, Ava Marie's doctoral degree, which she got from um, Edge Hill University in the United Ca uh, United Kingdom last year. So welcome, Ava Marie. Oh, hey, hey. <laughs> thank you so much for this fantastic start. And thank you so much for inviting me and having me presenting and speaking on this very interesting topic. Uh, and you waved my book a bit around there, Annie, and here's a an image of, of the one, the red one that you hold in your hands. Uh, and I'm going to speak a bit about this project that I've been doing for a couple of years and that I'm still working with. It's titled Resistance Within the Museum Fauna. And, um, and it centers around trying to, or the whole idea of the project is trying to write counter art histories from the perspective of non-human animals, a uh, kind of a, a new way of thinking of art history that isn't centered around humans, but other species. And to be able to do this project, then I had to invent a new term for myself, and that is uh, the term museum fauna. Um, next image, please. Thank you. So the museum fauna, it encompasses all the animals within the museum walls, both visible and invisible. So it is not only the animals that are portrayed, but it's also the animals that are hidden within materials, uh, like in glue or pigment, uh, trapped within the canvas. But it can also be all the animals that are actually used in the artist's studio by the artist uh, in brushes or in paint or whatever, or on the, on the chair that the artist is sitting on, perhaps. There are millions, countless animals stuck within art production that we don't really think about because they are not visible. The material that I use, other artists work before me. Maybe it is time that I start calling myself an art history activist as well as an artist. 
Okay, next in mid with this. Thank you. Uh, so I will give you an example uh, of how these counter art histories can be used. So I've been appropriating the guided tour for a while now. Uh, and instead of telling the stories centered around human affairs, I tell stories centered around non-human affairs and try to contextualize the painting. And I will give you one example. On, on my upper left corner, I don't know if that is yours, there is this really large painting. It's by a Swedish painter. His name is Carl Sederström. And the painting is about when King Charles XII died in war and is carried home to Sweden. So this didn't actually happen. It's a, like a romantic storytelling piece uh, that has quite a nationalistic agenda. But it is all centered around this king in the middle lying on this stretcher. And when I speak about this painting, I instead focus on the kapakai or you can also call them wood grouse, I think, hanging on the back of the, the hunter's back uh, to the left in the painting. There is this big bird hanging on the hunter's back. And if you look closely, you, know, you can find this painting easily online. If you look closely on it, you can see that there is blood running from its beak down into the snow. A really beautifully painted pain and suffering. Uh, but it happens uh, in the corner of the painting because it, everything else is centered around the king. Mm -hmm. So I could do these guided tours and I speak about all these animals that are entrapped within art production. And I find it uh, as a real effective way, actually. Uh, and the goal of all this is, of course, to have these animal or non-human animal stories and voices reverberate through the museum halls long after uh, the guided tour. Uh, you can change the image again, please. Thank you. I also want to quickly mention another artist uh, that has inspired me greatly. It's a French painter. Her name is Rosa Bonheur. She lived in and around Paris from 1822 to 1899. She, her work and my work around her work is also part of the, the resistance within the museum fauna. If you change picture again. Thank you. Uh, because uh, it's widely known or the idea around Rosa Bonheur is that she is an animal lover. There is not a single presentation about her that doesn't call her an animal lover. Uh, but she was also a very violent artist in prisoning a lot of uh, animals and also killing animals to be able to paint them. So being loved by Rosa Bonheur is actually a, sign, a sort of a death sentence. So I'm actively trying to rewrite the history about her and the art history surrounding her all her whole uh, work and all her works uh, to focus more on the animals that actually lived around her and that was objected to this art production and the violence around it. And it can take form as uh, drawings or video work or sculpture. And you can easily um, visit my website and have a look at this specific project, for example. There are videos on all other stuff. And I think that is my five minutes, actually. Thank you so much, Ava Marie. Uh, thank you so much. That was awesome, but quite dis uh, disturbing as well. I think um, I love when people rewrite these histories that we have come to just, um, you know, accept as the truth about particular times and histories and artworks. I'll move on now to the next artist, who is Bubby the Bear. Now, Bubby the Bear is a vegan artist and activist dedicated to giving a voice to the voiceless. And Bubby cares deeply about animal sanctuaries, uh, and a lot of the work Bubby does is related to these um, animal families within sanctuaries. Each story Bubby uh, is involved in uh, comes with uh, perhaps an unhappy tone, um, 
but the stories are also joyful because the, uh, they demonstrate how animals can find sanctuary and love and how sanctuaries can make uh, such a difference to animals' lives. The video that's going to be shown now uh, is called Life with Pigs and it's created by Ryan Phillips with illustrations by Bubby the Bear. In deep southern Virginia, near a pig farm or two, and the wind often smells like manure from trucks carrying poo, and the squeals of the inmates might be ignored by you, lives a company called Smithfield. Well, you might say it was that, but I fear it was more like a hell where pigs grow nice and fat. After they've been genetically modified to weigh too much to bear, and the pig's little legs can't carry them here or there. There, pigs are mistreated, no one dare really doubt. Many live in dark sheds, not ever let out. But this is what old Smithy, as we'll call it for short, this is what Smithy does like a sport. They take these poor pigs, often kicked, hit, and more. They take all these pigs to prepare them for something more. These sweet, intelligent pigs will not be rescued and find a home that's just right. Nor will they be loved and cuddled all night. These pigs have a fate much worse left in store. They are loaded on trucks for five hours or more. They are jostled and shaken and cramped and made sore. But in the summer, the heat makes them suffer so much more. Boiling in the sun, like being roasted alive. And in the winter, these pigs get to freeze on all sides. In the open air truck that will carry them down to the place of great sadness. Yes. Smithfield is the town. They must watch as each pig is forced to his doom. These intelligent creatures try to escape from the room. They crawl over each other, they squeal and try to climb gates. But Smithy just smiles until the struggle abates. And if it does not, then a shock prod is brought in. While others might worry, Smithy knows that he'll win. And the gas chambers Smithy uses, he says, are quite humane. Look for no further proof that he's gone quite insane. Gasping for air, watching friends slowly fall. How can Smithy just grin at something that should make him bawl? So each little pig gets to watch his friends die. And these intelligent creatures must ask themselves, why? Why don't they care? They are thinking of you, the people who buy ham and pork and yes, bacon too. Why do you pay money to someone who would do things like that? Yet we'd hate anyone who did this to a dog, horse or cat. But there is no real difference. It's all just a lie. We've been sold this same story in the hopes we will buy. Yet now knowing Smithy's pigs suffer, as we certainly do. How must we change knowing each word here is true? We must speak for the pigs, like I, the borax, have done. Because if we turn off our heart, then old Smithfield has won. So I, the borax, will ask with my old, saddened stare, Is it you? Are you brave? Will you be one to care? That's really um, an example, I think, of what I mentioned before, where it's quite a um, provocative but also gentle introduction to this kind of issue because we're not seeing real pigs and we can engage with the, the issue there in a less threatening way, which is often the way that these people make a first jump to really exploring and learning about these issues. So that's Bubby the Bear, beautifully uh, illustrated and crafted by Bubby the Bear and produced uh, by Ryan Phillips. Now the next 
um, guest or panellist today is the renowned author, Laura Jean McKay, from Australia. And as you can see, she, we were just talking beforehand how beautiful it looks where she is because she's in extremely sunny and humid and just gorgeous Brisbane. Um, so Laura wrote the multi-prize winning novel, The Animals in That Country, which um, has so many prizes, I probably can't list them all here, but I'll mention a couple. Um, it was published by Scribe in 2020, and the book has won the prestigious Arthur C. Clarke Award uh, and the Aurelius uh, Award for Best Science Fiction Novel uh, in 2021. Um, it's just become a classic kind of overnight. Um, I know that for a fact, <laughs> uh, teaching in the literature department. Uh, Laura is also an adjunct lecturer in creative writing at Massey University in New Zealand. Um, and she was awarded uh, New Zealand's very auspicious Waitangi Day Literary Honours. So Laura's new collection, which is hot off the press, I understand, is called Gunflower, Collection of Stories. Um, and I've been looking at the reviews online, which are, as you'd expect, amazing. Uh, also published by Scribe. And I understand, Laura, that you're going to be reading from this today for us, which is exciting. We'll get a taste of it before perhaps buying the book. Welcome. Thank you so much, Annie, and um, thank you, uh, everyone, for having me here today. I'm just in awe at the art and activism uh, that is occurring in this space. Uh, I am calling in from beautiful Mianjin, Brisbane, uh, on the banks of the Mewa River, on, and this is Turrbal and Jagara country, and I'd like to say Galang Naru Windawu in Turrbal language and Garamba Bigi in Jagara language. Uh, this I am reading from my co new collection, uh, Gunflower, and this short story was made in direct response to Jade Burstall's work, Trading Futures. Now, it was one of those beautiful um, commissions that happen sometimes between artists and writers where I was given an image with no explanation, and it was an image of a golden egg uh, broken on uh, on a road. Uh, and later on, after I'd produced this work, in response to that, I found out that that Jade is a vegan activist and artist herself. And um, but we didn't know this about each other. We just it was just there was just something about the work that that I had a very strong reaction to. But also I think uh, I was really interested in what Annie was saying about the image that she uses as part of her teaching, that, that image of a, of a tiny chick just about to go down the conveyor belt to his death. Uh, I think that this short story that I'm about to read you, I'm just going to read you a small section of it, um, could also be in response to that image. So this is The Last Days of Summer, the first few pages of that work. That summer stretched year long and we were always giving birth. We tried to make a game of it at first, taking turns in the narrow cells and pitching our cries like songs, but towards the end we were either just fat or skin. The cells formed a long hall, lit sixteen hours a day, and always the same. A fearsome golden light coming from the roof, particles of skin floating through the air, in our throats, our faces, the sisters above us and the sisters below. We were all born to the cell and none of us, not our mothers or their mothers before that, really knew if there was anything but the slanting cage floor, our cellmates, the heat. One of us had heard stories, though, said there was something more than standing and death. What is it? We asked her. Winter, she said. And what else? darkness. One of us had seen her sister die two cells over, sensed the familiar life coming to an end, and it gave her such a shock, her toes clenched over the bars of the floor. They couldn't get her loose. One thought of us all as sisters, and rubbed her raw skin against the bleeding cage when another passed away. The guards would bring in someone new, and after a while she'd forget and call her sister too. Well, some of us didn't care, were beyond caring. 
We felt the rage of the endless day beat like wings that we bit and scratched at. When she fell, we stood on her, flattening her head into the bruising bars. When we gave birth, it was over her body, even though she'd passed days before. We had our teeth removed and our arms made useless, so all we could do was stand and eat slop with our faces. We stood the long day round. Our bodies grew fat and our legs weak and we collapsed on each other. We gave birth over and over again. In the last days, the giddy, heady urge to birth slowed and then stopped and we shed hair instead. It fell down through the top cells and covered those below. To punish us, they stopped the food and turned out the lights and we were plunged into winter. During that time we told each other things. One said, the children we made were sent to war in three armies, the 600, 700 or 800 divisions, depending on their size. There were rumours of special units called roasters or broilers. None of them ever returned. Thank you. Wow. That's actually, um, I was talking about emotion in the uh, beginning. Uh, that's made me feel uh, very emotional. And as someone who, um, who loves my chickens and that I live with, uh, it even makes it more realistic to think about the horrible lives of those uh, wonderful birds. Thank you, Laura. Um, that's uh, very poignant. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, even though I'm feeling a bit sad after that, I'm also over the moon <laughs> now to uh, present um, Shannon Johnson, who um, is a professor of photography at Meredith University in North Carolina and also one of our esteemed doctoral students at the New Zealand Centre for Human Animal Studies and um, also a dear friend. Uh, hello, Shannon. <laughs> uh, so, so we're very lucky to have Shannon living with, with us now in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where she's completing her doctorate at the moment. Um, Shannon's art deals with themes that reclaim what or who has been discarded, uh, and she makes visible that which is hidden. So very much part of this theme of activist art, of course. Her landfill project Oh, sorry, her project, Landfill Dogs, was highlighted on ABC World News with Diane Sawyer. And she, it's also appeared on CNN. She's been talked on there. And her newest work called Roadside Zoo, uh, which is part of her doctorate, is a finalist in the 2023 Big Picture Natural World Photography Competition. And as we say in Aotearoa, kia ora. Shannon, Welcome. Hey, thank you so much, Annie, um, and uh, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be among these amazing artists whom I admire. Um, so art has always been in my heart, but animals came into my art later, and I adopted my first dog from a local rescue group, and this is her. This is Lula Bell. And um, at the time, I had been making photographs of my family, so Lula naturally made her way into the frame, but that's not how I came to focus on animals. Instead, it was a neighbor who asked me to come with her to our government-run um, county animal shelter, and that's when I began volunteering. I was stunned that every week there was another set of animals, um, and this is a composite of 378 animal shelter portraits that I made which are current to the number of animals that the shelter can hold at any given time. So I kept wondering, uh, where are all these animals coming from and where are they going? And this led me to my first um, animal activist project, which was called Breeding Ignorance, which is a documentary style photography project chronicling the weekly euthanasias at the government-run animal shelter in North Carolina, or one of them, I should say. Um, I thought that if people could just see the required euthanasias, um, they'd be motivated to spay and neuter their pets. And I'm going to spare you most of those images, um, but I just want you to know that this project did not have the intended effects. So instead of igniting positive action, um, some of the images were shared on smear, uh, in the public in smear campaigns against county shelters, which was not my point at all. 
So this got me thinking about other ways that art can speak about difficult topics and I hope to and hopefully inspire action on um, the animal's behalf before it's too late. And this is really how Landfill Dogs started. So for Landfill Dogs each week, I would take one dog who was most at risk for euthanasia and I would photograph him or her at Landfill Park. And then I'd share the images on the shelter's website and then also on a social media site that I started. So the reason why I used Landfill Park in particular, there's two reasons. The first one is that the dogs will end up in a landfill if they don't find a home. So below the surface at Landfill Park, there's more than 25,000 dogs buried there. And I really think of it as a burial ground. The second reason is because the animal shelter falls underneath the same um, government management as the landfill. So the thinking behind this is that pets are property, and when you don't want your property anymore, the government gives you somewhere to bring it. However, this landscape also offers a metaphor of hope. So it's a place of trash, um, but it's also been transformed into a place of beauty. And I hope that the viewer also sees the beauty in these homeless, um, unwanted creatures. Um, I'm really happy that this project was um, successful and it was only supposed to go on for a year, but it went on for four years um, with about 170 dogs getting adopted or being sent to rescue. But while I was working on landfill dogs, my father um, passed away um, quite quickly and unexpectedly. And one morning when I was missing him, I decided to use a little bit of his ashes um, in a child solder kit. And the result came out looking like a night sky. And I thought, oh, that's um, a perfect portrait of, of where he is now. But this got me thinking about what a gift it is to be able to mourn for someone and say, um, you know, your life was important to me. And so that made me think of all the animals who go into an animal shelter and who die alone and are forgotten. And I longed to create something that might memorialize them. So I collected ashes from a different shelter's um, crematorium, and I made these cyanotypes on fabric. And the point of them is to say, Al although I didn't know you, I am glad you were here, and your matter matters, at least to me. And these are made on fabric, and so my favorite place for them is to install them into skylights where they glow by day, um, as you can see in this exhibition from 2018. But animals held in cages, no matter animal shelters or at a zoo, particularly hurt my heart. And during the pandemic, when there was no photographing at animal shelters, I decided to take a university course um, in captive animal biology, um, which began a documentary style photography project um, for me called Roadside Zoo. And this also led me to my PhD work in trying to understand the ethics of looking at and making images of animal cruelty. And I am still in the documentary phase of this project, but I am really hoping it's going to take a different aesthetic turn before I'm through. And this is one experiment or example of where I'm um, trying to imagine the captive animals um, umwelt. So concurrently, I'm also collaborating on an activist project called Picturing Pigs about depicting pigs in a positive manner. So specifically... Picturing Pigs is a billboard advocacy project with two billboards placed along Interstate 40. Um, and it was just this past summer that they were placed there. Um, in the two counties in North Carolina that produced the most amount of pigs in the United States. So in these counties, pigs outnumber humans 29 to 1, but you'll likely never see a pig at all because they're hidden away on large-scale factory farms. But instead of showing the cruelty and distress that the millions of pigs in the same area endure, we chose to um, show the inverse of that, which is rescued pigs who get to live out the full extent of their life on their own terms. So this project was supported by a 2023 20, um, creativity grant from the Culture and Animals Foundation, which I'm very happy about, and they're a great organization. Um, and I would be amiss if I didn't mention the amount of pushback that we received from billboard companies about creating this. Um, and this is probably not at all surprising um, that the billboards are actually currently hidden behind foliage, so you can't see them at all. Um, although this might not be intentional on the part of the billboard companies, um, we see it as a metaphor for the pork industry's cover-up of pigs. So this has only added fuel to our fire, and we are currently working with a filmmaker and a writer, and we're hopefully making a documentary feature. And I hopefully there's one more slide that has um, a link to the trailer that you can watch on your own time because I know I am out of time. And 
There we go. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shannon. There's so many works there for us to discuss later. Um, and um, thank you for your photographic advocacy on behalf of animals. It's truly inspirational. And I can say that as uh, someone who um, has uh, been looking at many of Shannon's images related to her roadside uh, zoo's project. So uh, we move on now. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Just Wondering, an autonomous collective project which produces video essays and short animated speculative films. Um, and these are all critical of the status quo. The films explore anti-speciesism, post-humanism, environmental climate and social justice. And Just Wondering consists of Aaron Noor, who's the researcher and filmmaker, Mina Mimosa, visual artist and illustrator, and Maria Martelli, who we welcome today, um, who's a writer and scholar activist. Welcome, Maria. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Uh, I am Maria from Just Wondering, as uh, Annie already mentioned. We are a project. Um, we are three people. Um, and basically, just wondering if this this collective work that we do, we do video essays, as you can see. So normally, um, we would be showing a video essay, but right now, we we will, you will only see it uh, muted and without the essay, you will only see the 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 visual part of it. So I can I can speak about our project. So, I mean, uh, this project started in. 2016 by researcher Aaron Nord and uh, illustrator Mina Mimosa. And it came as a way to express the ideas that they found important in a way that felt right to them. So really working with the skills that they had in graphic design and illustration rather than doing public speaking, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, but later I joined and then we, we kind of settled on this format of three people. Uh, and we still collaborate with many people sometimes, but it's just, we are like the core of the project. And, uh, at the beginning, I think we didn't realize how important animal issues will be in our project, but all three of us were vegan and, uh, veganism was always a thing that was at the beginning, from the very beginning of just wondering and what we did. And then what happened and what I think is really important is that through our friendship and through our closeness, we started to explore what the veganism means more deeply. What does it mean to want animal liberation? And then we, we really started to go into uh, more complex theories of anti-speciesism and how do these relate to social justice, to other social justice matters. So since the beginning of Just Wondering, we created over 30 video essays and more than half of them have at the center an anti-species framework. We've also worked on one animated short film about climate and multi-species justice, which was screened and awarded at international festivals. And all of our videos uh, are free to watch on YouTube. Uh, and for our latest essays, you can also find them on our website with the text, which I think is, is a really an important part. And we also have the bibliography of all the research that we have done. And the images are also, uh, have the all descriptions, uh, embedded within our website. So the things that we do right now on, on, uh, our, we have different playlists. We have the playlist with collaborations in which people can send us uh, things that they find, the texts that they find to work with our project and our values. And then we can see if we can work together. And we have a playlist with thinkers and concepts in which we explore thinkers and concepts basically that we find, uh, that we find important and critical to, to animal liberation and to total liberation to how these things connect. Uh, and also just things that we find that are really interesting to think about, right? So just, just wonder, but also ground them in this political framework. 
So really our animations generally explore, explore the broader field of critical animal studies, most of them, and we try to, to bring together theory and narrative. So bring together, um, you know, this uh, disciplinary uh, new critical research that is being done in vegan sociology and critical animal studies in post-humanism, um, ecofeminism and so on, and bring them together uh, in a more sort of emotional way uh, in the ways in which we can we can make the films using, using images, using sounds, using the tone of voice and the narrative and so on. And, and we do this, I think it's the central idea is that we hope that by theorizing and criticizing visu and visualizing these things is that we can push further these ideas of total liberation from all forms of oppression and at the same time bring closer imaginaries of multi-species communities. So we want people to be able to envision multi-species flourishing worlds um, that take animals, political agency seriously and worlds that don't hide away from tensions and conflicts. So we want to help people think of spaces where all bodies and abilities are appreciated and respected, to consider how differences would not be constraining but liberating, to have these communities that are critical of anthropocentric values that are not based on imperialist, colonialist, or humanist projects. So really, again, trying to push further what it means to be anti-speciesist, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti-ableist, uh, feminist, queer, and, and joyful communities, always trying to break current uh, hierarchies and challenging the structures of dominance. So for example, the video that you are seeing now running that's muted is one of our only videos in Romanian. And within it, we really try to bring together many of the things we have been researching throughout the years and to do our own theorizing uh, on what anti-specism means to us and trying to relate it to other political positions, the ones that I mentioned before. So the video is, is subtitled in English. And within it, we stated that anti-specism is an against, but it is also a towards. It is also a beyond beyond what we know now towards something else, something we can only find out together, recognizing those that were invisibilized, marginalized, silenced, whose languages aren't recognized and whose lives are outside any responsibility. So now I, I want to conclude on, on this note that I mentioned our short animated film, uh, which by the way, was also supported by Cultures and Animals Foundation. But I did not mention its title. So its title is We Fly, We Crawl, We Swim. And it marks the many ways in which we can move from within our different embodiments, different abilities, different species towards liberation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, I found that absolutely mesmerizing and you know, you just can't take your eyes off the screen as it's develop as it's emerging there. But also, it's an incredibly powerful way of um, representing speciesism, anthropocentrism, uh, patriarchal domination, and so on. Um, and I love the idea that you bring in about multi-species flourishing. I thank you very much for that, and I'm sure we'll return to that in our discussion later. Now, I'd like to introduce. Um, well, it's actually a great thrill to introduce the next panellist, who's um, been my friend for over 20 years. Uh, hi, Carol Giliotti. Hi. Um, we met at the very first, I think one of the very first Human Animal Studies conferences. Um, right. right. Well, it'd be nearly 20 or over 20 years ago. I can't quite remember. Yeah. Um, which was hosted at Indiana University by another artist, uh, the poet Alice Miller. I was a US poet. Yeah. Um, and Carol and I hit it off straight away. Um, Carol is Professor em Emerita of um, Design and Dynamic Media and Critical and Cultural Studies at um, Edith Carr University in Vancouver. And she's the author of the um, soon to be um, classic, because I think it's probably a bit early yet, but it's going to be a dominant text on everybody's tables, the creative. Lives of Animals, published by New York University Press. 
She's also the editor of Leonardo's Choice, which is an awesome volume if you're interested in debates about animal, about ethics in art involving animals. Uh, Carol is an artist herself. She's an activist scholar, and her work focuses on the reality of animals' lives as important contributors to the biodiversity of the planet. Carol, it's wonderful to see you, and I'm going to hand it over to you now, but see you later. Thank you, Annie. Okay. Thanks so much, Annie. And everyone, I'm so happy you have no idea to see such great work. Um, I've been around a long time, <laughs> and um, it, it, it's just great to see all this work coming out that is just so powerful. So thank you very much. Um just what you're looking at is, and I'm going to sort of go back a little bit, but what you're looking at is from a piece uh, that is a uh, online animated graphic novel. What you can't see is that the birds, when you're online looking at it, the birds are flying over uh, the image and the fox who is standing in the middle of the clearing. The piece is called Trump and the Animals, which always seems to get sort of a snort whenever <laughs> I say that, um, or a laugh. Um, I just want to go back a little bit. Um, I w w have been involved in animal activism, and my work has been about animals for really the whole time I've been an artist. Um, and I... I would say that the first series that really I think I felt like it really made somewhat of a mark um, was called Tales from the Factory Farm. So I always work in series. Now I always work with words and, and images. Um, that was a 15-piece series. The next series was um, uh, a t uh, Tales of the Hurricane Horse, which um, uh, was in four, had lots of words, and the the first thing on one of the the uh, the images said, "Fuck you, Descartes, you bastard." So that was that was my my thinking at the day, which I still hold to. And um, then the next series was um, uh, the Baited Bear, which is about. And then I started to go really large, four, be four feet by six feet. So that was a single piece, and it's obviously about bears being used, at least this particular one, in in uh, dog bear baiting for for dog hunting. Um, and both that and the hurricane horse I used, I I got from uh, newspaper articles. Um, the next series, um, which I worked on for quite a long time, was called the Dante series, or is called the Dante series. And that's nine pieces, four feet by six feet, and is about animal experimentation. It's kind of based on Dante's Inferno, but I wrote all the text. Um, and actually, it was really um, wonderful that uh, Tom Reagan uh, happened to see some of the pieces and uh, that's how I met Tom. We he left his card and said, "Call me." <laughs> um, and it, it, I'm sure you know who Tom Reagan is. I don't have to explain. But if the audience doesn't know who Tom Reagan is, if you're a new interested animal advocate, he's a wonderful, wonderful philosopher. Now past, but um, certainly um, in North America was the animal rights philosopher. Um, in any case, um, when I did my doctorate, when I was in um, uh, in my 40s or so, I started writing. And I, I was making animation, learning animation, making animation, but I started writing and really enjoyed it. Um, and so Annie already told you the books that uh, have come out. I wrote lots of academic papers, but I always was involved in critical animal studies. And um, uh, so I, I, and I'm unfortunately, or fortunately, a very outspoken person. So I was always talking about that. I even got, when I was teaching, to make um, uh, classes, critical animal studies, um, 
and uh, meanings of new technologies, which involve animal issues as well, um, and environmental ethics. So um, I'm not too sure that I have... Oh, we forgot to talk about Trump and the animals. So let's go to the next slide, just so you can kind of see um, what's going on here. So the, the bear in this piece online actually shifts his head and looks directly at you. So the, narr the, the narrative of this graphic novel is that all the forests, all the animals in the forest come together and they just think the world is horrible and what are they going to do? Could we go to the next piece? Um, so this section actually sort of outlines the environmental issues as, as well as the uh, issues for animals. And obviously this one is about sheep who are being killed. Um, and uh, then at the end of that first chapter, the mouse speaks up and uh, says, well, dreams. We know that sometimes we can get into people's dreams. Why don't we use that to change their minds? And then it goes to the next chapter. And I'm still working on the next chapter. Um, the book took a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of research. I spent, I'd say, 10 years on the book between research and stopping points. And finally, when it came out in 22, I was pretty tired. So I'd like to get back um, to making to making the animations. Um, but I kind of have an idea for a second book. Anyway, I'm done. I, I just, again, want to say that everyone here, I'm so happy to see you. Um, just, it's wonderful. And I hope people are watching and are going to be able to say yes That's it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Carol. That's wonderful. And I think we need a big collective announcement. Fuck you, Descartes, you bastard. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> like and um, <laughs> I love it. I love it, Carol. Um, and so uh, there's so much to say about Carol's work because it's so diverse. Um, but, yeah, it's just an incredible collection of academic and artistic activist work. And I'm sure we'll be discussing several of Carol's um, projects later on. I particularly like it if we could get to the creative lives of animals as her, as her book, um, which actually talks about animals and their creativity, which is for some, unfortunately, an unusual um, premise. And that's because of Descartes, a lot of that. So I'll stop rambling and um, go to the next panellist. And it's my great pleasure to now um, present Michelle Waters uh, from the Santa Cruz Mountains in California, another lovely place that um, I'd like to be at rather than here perhaps. Um, beautiful place to live. I've been there. And uh, Michelle, hello. Your art is um, influenced by 35 years of activism for animals and the planet. Uh, Michelle has a BA of Art from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and an award-winning um, work, which has uh, lots of award-winning works which have featured in solo and uh, collective exhibitions across the United States um, and in Europe. Michelle is represented by the Cactus Gallery in Los Angeles um, and belongs to three international artist collectives, Hinge, I think. Am I pronouncing that right? Is it Hinge? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Artists for Conservation is another one of the uh, collectives that she works with in Art for Compassion Project. Um, so we welcome Michelle. Thank you so much for being part of the panel, Michelle. Okay. Um, well, thank you for including me in this. I'm, I'm so inspired by everybody who's presented so far, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, so I've been painting about the exploitation of animals um, by humans for almost 40 years. I started as an art student and I was really influenced by Sue Ko, um, especially in the beginning. And I still count her as an influence, although my work has changed quite a bit. Um, and this painting is called What for Dinner. Um, it is about 
uh, 20 years old or so. It's large. It's about um, 40 inches square. And um, it is part of a series of large, kind of in-your-face, more confrontational artwork that I did. It's been shown quite a bit. Um, I did have one person tell me that she stopped eating animals after seeing this painting. I don't know if she went vegan, but she went vegetarian after seeing this. Um, she said she was, this show had a dog with her and she had an epiphany that, you know, eating animals was eating, eating chicken, pigs, cows was just like eating her dog, which of course is not something she would do, that this painting could influence that. Next slide, please. Uh, they're called Luddites, and uh, this was influenced by my experiences as, a, as an environmental activist working on a variety of issues affecting wildlife, including fighting logging um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains where I live. This is one of a series of paintings that depicts wild animals uh, opposable and taking back their world from humation. Next slide, please. This is called The Activist. And I painted it for a, show, a solo show of animal rights art that I had in San Jose, California, about 10 years ago. You know, I thought about a lot, like it, it really, in a lot of ways, is a self-portrait. And I've had a number of animal activists tell me that they can really relate to this because you feel like you're pulled in all these different directions, hearing about different forms of exploitation and oppression. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a newer piece. Um, this is called Consequences, and it was painted two years ago. I was thinking about the animal forest and how it's being burned to provide sheep burgers and also soy, um, GMO soy to feed cattle with. And, you know, right as I was painting this, um, the heat dome happened over the Pacific Northwest, where uh, I think there were towns in British Columbia that got up to like 121 degrees or something crazy like that. Um, and a lot of fires in the queuing. And so, uh, consequences, yeah, this is, you know, some of the consequences of our, our addiction to, um, animal products, our, our addiction to fossil fuel. And, you know, the, my current paintings, um, are, you know, I'm, I'm more, instead of being really confrontational, which I think that approach definitely has a lot of merit. Um, I'm really trying now to create beautiful work to try and entice people in and then tell them, give them the facts of what my art is responding to, um, particularly the extinction crisis is that we're in because um, I personally am vegan just as much for wild animals as I am for farmed animals um, because farming, farming animals for food is the number one cause of species extinction. So all of all the paintings that I'm going to be showing now are a response to the biological annihilation of the sixth mass extinction, which we know humans are causing. In the last 50 years, two thirds of all, all wild animals have been wiped off the face of the earth due to us, our species, um, and domesticated mammals that humans eat are now 60% of all mammal life on the planet. Human beings are 35% of all birds farmed birds. Okay, so this one, this is called Don't Fence Me In. And um, uh, people in California may be familiar. I, I don't know that there's many of us, but uh, may be familiar with this. The issue that this is responding to, it's an ongoing situation at Point Reyes National Seashore, which is in Northern California and part of the federal national park um, system. And in this national park, a third of the land is leased by cattle ranchers and dairy farmers, which is... Um, kind of a relic of when the National Park was um, established in the early 60s, um, the cattle ranchers and dairy farmers were allowed to stay, but they it wasn't supposed to be into perpetuity. But um, for the last 60 years, every, every few years, um, they, you know, comes up, their lease comes up for renewal and it keeps being released. And so um, there's now to the implications for wildlife about this national seashore. This is a painting of a tule elk, and tule elk are a species uh, which nearly went extinct in California, and they should have Endangered Species Act protection, but they don't because of the political power of ranchers. The elk are fenced off from fresh water and forage, 
And uh, a couple of years ago, the National Park Service approved a plan to kill Tule elk in favor of cows, basically because of political pressure from the ranchers in the area and from the politicians who protect them. 90% of public submitted comments opposing ranching in the park. And during the drought, during 2021 to 20 or 2020 to 2021, more than a third of one of these elk herds died of starvation and thirst directly because of, of the um, ranching and dairy farming that are in this park. Next slide, please. This is a, a recent painting I did this year. It's called Encroachment, and um, it shows burrowing owls, which is um, a species, an American species of small owls that nest in ground squirrel burrows. They were once really common here um, near where I live. They've been almost completely wiped out by rampant development. and Another, this is another species that should have endangered species that protection, but don't because of politicians. Um, I might add that um, I was talking about Point Reyes National Seashore. There are burrowing owls there. Um, we know um, that um, wildlife are killed every year at Point Reyes National Seashore when the farmers do their silage, um, including all kinds of nesting birds and fawns and uh, a lot of different species. Next slide, please. Okay, this is this is a very recent painting. Um, this is called Saint P22, and for any of you who don't know who P22 was, um, he was a mountain lion who lived in Los Angeles in Griffith Park um, for over ten years, and he crossed two large, very large, multi-lion freeways to get there, and then basically, because there's so little habitat left for the large animals um, and roads are, you know, a major problem for them. He, that's where he lived um, for, you know, over a little over a decade. He died, um, he died after being hit by a car last December. Um, and the Southern California and Central California populations of mountain lions have state endangered species act protection now because so many of them have been killed by cars. I would like to see red anthracite banned everywhere. And oh, oh, I should say that this painting, um, St. P22, was, was done to benefit um, one of, which is going to be one of the largest wildlife crossings on Earth when it's finished, the Wallace-Annenberg Wildlife Crossing, which is, is currently being built over the 101 freeway a little bit north of, of Los Angeles. It's going to reconnect wildlife habitat. So next slide. Please. So this last painting is called Waning Pangolin Moon. And a lot of people watching probably know that pangolins are the most illegally traded mammal on the planet. It's estimated that more than 1 million of them have been snatched from the wild in the past decade. And all eight species of pangolins are considered threatened with extinction. And they're all on the IUCN red list of threatened species. It's all because of poaching for consumption of the animals and their body parts. So that is my last piece. Um, I really, you know, just want to close by saying nature is my church. And I really try and reflect that idea in my art. And the natural world is sacred. We need it. We humans need it for our physical sustenance, but we also need nature and wild animals for our species, or for our spirit. Excuse me. Thank you so much. That's fantastic, Michelle. Wow. I don't know what to say. I agree with you about, um, well, I love that you say nature is your church. I think nature is my spirituality as well. And um, I just found your paintings um, really inspirational, even um, even quite beautiful. Like they're very beautiful, the last ones, but of course they're very poignant because of the meanings and context behind them. Um, and I also think the provocative paintings you showed at the beginning um, – those are exactly the kind of things I want to show my class. So thank you for um, sharing them with me. And I'm sure that, I'll, that you'll be teaching into my class soon through your paintings. Thank you. Um, and now I'm very delighted to introduce uh, Julia Denos, who is an award-winning winning author and illustrator. So this is see how many um, different kinds of modes of medium of art or ways of doing art is occurring in this um in this event, um, and so now we have an award-winning illustrator, which is fabulous. Um, 
Julie is based in Beverly, Massachusetts. She's a vegan animal lover. Um, I suspect we all are. Um, and um, she's a student of all things botanical, very passionate about using her work to connect to people, to animals, and to plants in healing, reverent, and magical ways. I love the sound of that. Her latest children's book is called Sanctuary, A Home for Rescued Farm Animals. And it honours the animals that she has met who have been rescued from, of course, those industries that we all despise, the meat, dairy and egg ones. Um, in Sanctuary, the book uh, advocates for animals from a child's perspective. So this is another aspect of today's uh, panel, quite different. Um, and Julia's work encourages ecological awareness and simple actions for things like plant-based community building. Um, and I had a look at some of your books online, um, Julia, and they're fabulous. I'm, I've got a young niece who I'm definitely going to order some for. Um, so thank you very much for being here, Julia. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, wow, my mind is blown. <laughs> um, I'm just so happy to connect with you all, and I'm I'm heartened to know that um, – this amount of material is in, in so many different versions of the voice or it's going out into the world now. Um, thank you, Annie. And uh, thank you so much to Robin and Aruka Animal for the honor to join these amazing activists. So cool. Um, my name is Julia Dinos and I'm an author and illustrator of books for children, but I always say for people of all ages, because really we all have a child inside of us that remembers our connections to our connection to the animals and to the earth. Um, and this piece right here is actually one that I recently did for Earth Day um, in uh, multimedia. And I posted it on Instagram, but it just kind of highlights, I wanted to put this as my first slide because um, it's all about story. And I believe that stories are the most powerful things that we have as humans. Um, and I believe that we can change our consciousness and our stories and they're connected, they're intertwined. This is actually... Uh, the cover of my book, Sanctuary, a Home for Rescued Farm Animals, that published this year, January um, 2023, with Harper Collins. Shout out to my editor, Kate O'Sullivan, and my awesome designer, Celeste Nudson. Um, this is actually the first book that I've written that is focused solely on animals um, and children. As a vegan, I went vegan in 2017. So um, it's actually just the beginning, just the start of what I'm trying to do within children's literature. Um, and so that last piece was actually um, a video that I filmed um, in response to the um, invasion of the sanctuary in Italy. Um, last It was last month, I think now. Um, Progetto Cuore Liberi. Project Free Hearts in Pavia, Italy. And so I did a special reading um, in that location um, to join the voices of the protesters that were head heading to Milan um, because I believe that the concept of sanctuary is such a sacred boundary. And so I wanted to, um, to just highlight what that was. And my book is about that special kind of imagining of that sacred space and what it could look like. So Sanctuary features um, a diverse cast of humans and animals, and they repeat throughout the pages of the book. I purposely used very um, simple language that could be used as a tool either at a sanctuary reading to children with animals interacting as well, um, or just to connect to the very simple child heart that all of us grown children still have. Um, next slide, please. These are just some stills from the book. So you are someone, not something. Um, this is actually featuring a goat, Marky, who is um, a very sweet and beautiful spirit that I met at um, Unity Farm Sanctuary in Sherborne, Massachusetts. The, uh, next slide. Thanks. And this is um, featuring Dudley. A really another beautiful spirit who is just his heart if you ever meet him at unity farm sanctuary is so enormous he 
comes right to the edge of um, his pen, and he loves to interact with people of all ages. So I had to honor him in the book. Um, I did a lot of my research, my visual research at Unity Farm Sanctuary, thanks to Kathy Halamka, the co-founder there. So here your value comes from being you. It's just a simple, um, a simple statement that is true, and it's true for all bodies. Um, next slide, please. This is just a little shot of my studio. Um, that's a piece that is going into the auction for their Thanks Living Art Auction that's actually going to go live at Unity Farm Sanctuary. And I think it will be Sunday is when that auction goes up. So there will be multi multiple artists um, have put uh, really beautiful pieces and submissions in to raise money for Unity Farm Sanctuary. A sanctuary is a sacred boundary, a place where human and non-human animals can live in a kind of a radical peace, where bodily autonomy, individuality, social bonds, and deeply complex emotional inner lives are respected across species. Here your value comes from being you. Not the milk and cheese you are forced to make, not your eggs or your babies or the meat that they take. No, here your body is safe. Your family is safe. Your heart is safe and mine. You can trust the next slide is to help you heal. You can rest and grow old. Here you can dream a deep dream. For you and I, we both dream indeed. And so um, those are some excerpts from the book Sanctuary. And I just thought I'd throw in a few more recent pieces that I've just done um, as kind of reactionary protest art. So this is about the wolves being delisted. Um, and I actually ended up putting this up on Instagram the day that I think the wolf um, killing begins in September, like the official day. I can't remember the date of it. It's September 20th. Can't remember. I'm sure someone in here might know that. Um, but I really believe that um, children have this in, innate feeling of rebellion. They know what, what's right and wrong. And I think the children and animals and the planet were all working together. Um, and so I just wanted to start doing um, pieces that will encourage um, people in the children's literature industry um, to think differently about this interaction because many, um, many times stories within children's literature put animals as um, background or it's very similar to how we interact with animals in the real world. Um, they kind of service the human story as the center. So um, I wanted to make the, well, the biggest biggest visual element there there was um and then the kind gesture between the connection of the child and the wolf as present too and so this is a, um a series i've begun that's um kind of um it's almost like i'm creating a portfolio of um new covers covers for stories that i wish existed and i haven't written yet <laughs> so next slide please and this is a piece that I did as a reaction to the um, invasion of the Progetto Cori Libri um, Sanctuary in Pavia, Italy. Um, it features actually, um, that's Krusca right there. Um, there, uh, I'm sure that I'm sure many of you are aware are aware of that invasion that happened, um, where the caretakers and um, protesters were actually overcome by the Italian state police. The Polizia, um, they actually went into and overcame the protesters physically and um, euthanized the pigs, uh, whether they were healthy or not, because of the African swine flu that was spreading through the intensive pig farms in the Pavia area region. And um, this sanctuary actually had petitioned and legally done all the steps they could um, and were actually about to go to court um, when they received this um it was like a morning raid, and um, I remember waking up and seeing the footage of it and being completely destroyed. Um, a lot of my research has been um, 
based on animals and plants. In Italy, I'm Italian American. And so I was doing a lot of Italian research at the time. And so it felt exactly right to make this piece. It was what I had to do seeing what had happened. Um, and so this is the mother of animals. And she is saying, basta, enough. And these are the children of the sanctuary. We can speak more about that in a bit. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Carl. And so these are just pieces um, where I've started to unpack um, vegan concepts and try to make small, bite-sized pieces for my social media audience where people can um, learn about the industry but see one image and then read a little bit in the caption. So this was a reaction to my research that I've recently been doing into organic far organic farms and trying to counteract that narrative. Oh, it's a small family fun family run organic dairy farm in Vermont. Vermont of all places, right? It's supposed to be the the dairy capital with the idyllic meadows and flowers um, where children go to pet the baby cows. And of course, as soon as you start doing research into it, um, you're met with organic family-run dairy farms that chain the calves to their hutches. That is just standard practice. And so it has been a little difficult because the children's book industry still is heavily, um, these, these industries are still very um, popularly celebrated in children's literature and in books. It's very commonplace to have dairy farms ce celebrated and, um, there's not really any critical um, debunking of these narratives. And so I think it's important to start opening minds, especially for children who deserve to know the truth. Next slide, please. And so this is the piece that I read before the Milan protest, um, which was happening in response in Italy, um, which garnered 10,000, I think it was at least 10,000 to 11,000 people who... Um, gathered in Rome to protest that invasion of Progetto Cori Liberi. And it was absolutely beautiful to watch that. Um, and so this is a piece that was just a commentary on that because I really truly believe this. Um, our piece really does, it's all interconnected. Next slide, please. And then this is just the last piece. I think I'm out of time, but um, this is a piece that I did um, last Thanksgiving. So here we are back again. Um, trying to hold space for those the millions of um, turkeys that will be lost um, or have been lost already um, because of this holiday that purports to celebrate life with death. So this was a piece um, to just comment on the radical nature of love. If we can expand it, um, it shouldn't have to be radical, but it is in a society that... Um, champions the opposite so thank you so much thank you so much that's absolutely amazing julia um and i'm definitely going to get the book that says go forth my child and rebel for my niece it's um i'd like that to be her mantra as she grows up um and thank you so much for putting animals to the fore in your work um so many children's books uh like you like you mentioned, um, the drama is about the child um, or some way it's always human-centred and um, those illustrations and the words are just beautiful and I think that they'll make a huge difference to many children who read them. And, then, you know, as you say, lots of children are animal lovers connected to animals um, just naturally before they grow up and um, are conditioned to disregard many and love some. So I also love how you finished on a hopeful note there um, because we've seen um, quite an array of uh, images of animal exploitation. Um, there's quite a lot to digest uh, emotionally and also like just thinking about all this um, and it was lovely to end on a hopeful note looking at those children's books. Thank you so much. So now, what we're going to do now is, um, well, we're going to invite the audience to send in any questions or comments they have for this group or for specific artists. Um, 
and um, I have to admit that I'm not sure that my technology is working to receive those, but I can ask Carl, the producer, if he fo- if he has sure. any coming through. Thank you, uh, Carl. There are no comments on YouTube per se. Okay. So how you can um, uh, send us your comments or questions is through YouTube, um, and uh, Carl's going to just keep an eye on them. Uh, and we've also got some topics that I've kind of thought about that we can discuss, um, or the artists can discuss. However, I'm just wondering if we can start it off, perhaps, this kind of conversation that we'll have. Um, maybe just um, hearing from you about your experiences of seeing other artists work on behalf of animals in this um, event. And we're just doing this informally, so it's just going to be about jumping in, I think, um, and having your say. Some people are missing, but uh, we can start anyway. So, you know, how how did you, as artists, uh, experience this event? And, and was there anything, is there any artwork that was shown that you'd like to comment on? Laura, thank you. Um, I, this has just been such an incredible space to be in. Uh, Way back in the '90s, I I did a I was lucky enough to go to art school and did a photography degree. I'm the worst photographer who has ever <laughs> taken a photo, but it really it really influenced me and and gave me a really strong visual foundation, which I use every day in my writing. But it, and I'm a, around a lot of writers now, and I I love that. But it is so thrilling to be amongst um, a group of artists who are working. In, in many, many different spaces. And, you know, I'm particularly thrilled to uh, to discover, even though I'm sure a lot of people already know your work, Shannon, um, Shannon Johnston's work because cyanotypes were my favourite medium to work in when I was a, a baby photographer. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I searched the internet on a semi-regular basis for cyanotypes. And so to see, and I'm also really, really fascinated um uh, and I haven't quite been able to capture this in my own writing about the connection between grief um, and and the state that we're in in the world. Ecological grief is really fascinating to me and I, I know there are a lot of artists, um, I'm particularly thinking of the writer Octavia Cade who is, is from Aotearoa and who works in a speculative fiction space and, and looks at, at ecological grief. But Shannon, your work, just, I, I mean, I've, I've never seen anything like it. I just think your practice is so, so um, beautiful and and um, just gets me right at the heart. So, yeah. That is just so generous of you to say that. And I, um, I have to say, I, I completely agree with you about being in the presence of these other artists who all communicate on behalf of other um, beings. And I, I find that to be extremely exciting. And, but, uh, but thank you for for what you said. Uh, before we start, if, if people are wanting to send in questions, you might need a reminder of, because there's so many different wonderful presentations of everybody here. Um, I know that Ava Marie, you're um, at, in uh, probably about one in the morning in Sweden. So let's start um, with your project. So um, there's such a range of issues and themes represented in these awesome, wonderful art projects from rewriting and challenging um, exploitative historical paintings and other museum works um, involving animals in Ava Marie's um, presentation, to highlighting the fate of pigs through animation, uh, which was Bubbly the Bear, to stories foregrounding the experience of chickens or other birds in the highly exploitative um, poultry or egg farming industries um, in Laura's short story, to Shannon's photographic um, activism on behalf of shelter animals and um, animals incarcerated in zoos or roadside zoos, to the video essays exploring anti-speciesism, intersectional social justice and multi-species flourishing by just wondering, including Maria Martelli, uh, to Carol's um, Somewhat humorous politicised projects, um, Trump and the Animals, and Fuck You Day, Cart You Bastard, very good. To inspirational and sometimes 
sometimes confrontational anti-speciesist and environmentalist paintings of Michelle. There she is, yay. To Julia's very beautiful illustrated children's book about Century for Animals, um, which was a nice way to finish. Um, so hopefully that's reminded um, any viewers or the audience um, about each presentation, not that you would need reminding because they were all extraordinary and very memorable, but um, there's a lot of speakers today. So There is a comment consenting. from the audience. Okay, there's a comment from somebody. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll read it on YouTube. Yep. Anya asks, this is a question for all wonderful artists presenting today. How do you keep your emotional sanity and how do you find hope to continue your work? And that's a really good question. I'm just going to answer it because I've been at this for so long that there are times when I'm just not saying. Um, it's just in, almost impossible at times to be, to take all that in um, and also to be a human living in a world with humans who eat animals, use animals, um, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it's so frustrating and so incredibly, um, devastating to one's <laughs> being as a human that you know that all the people and sometimes people you love are doing these terrible things. So, um, I, I, I finally found a way to think about it, and it was from Martin Luther King when he said, just keep your eye on the prize. And that's what I've tried to do is just keep thinking what the prize is, which is a much, much better, better world for animals. And, and just keep that in mind and keep working. And, uh, you know, you still, there's still days when you just want to stay in bed. But in the long run, I, you know, we can't give up hope. We have to just keep trying. And that's, of course, now true for everything in terms of species extinction, extinction and, 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 you know, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's all I'll say. It's a very important point, though, Carol, to keep the hope alive there because uh, you can feel very it can feel very despairing and you can feel quite alone, I, you know, especially if your family is different from you and the way that they think and so on. Anyone else um, want to talk about, answer that question from, the, from Anya? I can expand a bit on that. Thanks, uh, Adelry. Yeah. So uh, sometimes in my practice, I... I, I I really stare at the violence. I stay with the violence. I look at it for quite some time, try to figure it out. Um, and when it becomes too painful, I try to look a bit to the side and feel okay with that as well. You know, looking at other paintings around, looking at other artists working, looking at uh, maybe some of like, I don't know if, if this is like completely weird way to, to say it, but like the softer consequences of violence. Yeah. And, uh, and also like look to the side or look to beauty and stay for, stay in that for a while uh, to just like keep sane, as you say, Carol, because we're in this for the long run. So yeah, and like have good food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but so like trying to figure out a way to work that is like mm. where, that it's okay to keep on working, but also like in an but in the same pole practice somehow. Can I add one more thing to that too? I think that is a really I I love how you said that about looking to the side and you know uh, you know to continue working but pausing and stuff. I I also um think that it's really healthy to cry you know and I think that like when there's nothing else you can do you know like a, when you're in a situation where there's you you can't change the f situation for for that creature you're just watching them suffer that like 
crying is an absolutely healthy thing to do to help get through and to keep moving. So that's not the only thing, but <laughs> I think that is something that helps me. I, I really love the notion that's coming up of, of, you know, staying with the trouble. Really it is. Um, I, I, I've noticed that uh, a lot of people, friends and and also um, people who are reading my work and other writers will often warn me um, that, you know, not to read a book because, you know, there's animal um, torture or, or something in the book or, Laura, you won't want to see this movie because, you know, there's, you know, bad things happen to animals, you know, the dog dies. And I always say to people, I've seen you know, I've been researching this stuff for a decade and I haven't turned away. I, I've seen all of the videos and all of the trauma and I've seen animals, you know, you know, living animals, you know, suffer so much. So actually I think we're in a very strong place to be able to look at, at, um, at our, you know, our violent relationships with animals um, head on. And I, I really encourage other people, you know, not to not to shy away, to take time out and, and to cry and to grieve, but also just to to look directly at um, at these relationships and 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 face them. And and also I suppose bear witness to to um, mm. to other species lives. Anyone else um, want to uh, want to have a explain your process in that way for Anya? Okay. Well, um, we're still waiting on some comments to come through. Um, so what I um, what I'd like to ask you, actually, because I'm really interested in this, is um, I don't have a creative bone in my body. And I wish I did, but I don't. I've never been able to learn music. I've never done any painting. Um, I used to write stories when I was a child, but that was squashed through everything else that happened, in, um, including academic writing. So um, I do live in awe of artists. And I mean, mainly artists um, who I think are, um, make a change in the world, really, for for animals, the environment, and people. So as I said before, I'm very humbled to be amongst the presence of all of you. But I was wondering, um, I find the art, all the art that's been presented today, very emotional. And um, it's also working with politics, though. You know, it's about power, issues of power. And I wonder how you work how you as artists bring together those issues of power with emotion um so i'm not just talking about necessarily uh, your emotions um which of course we've just talked to heard um obviously come into creations but about how you think about the emotions of the of your viewers or your readers um when you are creating a politicised piece of work, if that makes sense. How do those two things come together in your work? I, I would say, and I, I didn't say this when I was talking about my work, that the creative lives of animals, the whole goal was to have people start to look at animals not as victims, but as powerful, essential beings. And all the research on creativity and culture um, makes that point uh, really, really well and is continuing to do that. I mean, you know, if scientists' minds can be changed, <laughs> then yeah. all kinds of people can change their mind. And I, I think, I forget who it was who said... Um, I don't know, somebody else said something about the idea that if you are, uh, he wanted to show something that was not just about the misery. And, and, and so after a lifetime of doing that, I felt like I really needed to, to do something different. So, and, and I, I found that in a number of the pieces and the number of the, the, the you know, the works, um, that people are working on. In one way or another. 
And your book is very hopeful, um, Carol, because it's actually focused on animals and their ways of being creative, which spins the whole yeah. thing around again. Yeah. It's very yeah, that was anti-anthropocentric. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> it worked, yeah. 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 So um, anyone else? Like, like, you know, what's the process? Oh, yes, please. Hello, Maria. Uh, yeah, can I jump in? I I, sure. I wanted to 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 say something about what you said that I think I think uh, and I think Carol will agree with me because I just started reading your book, Carol, and I think part of the point is that all animals are creative, right? So I think Annie, also you are creative. Painting and <laughs> writing is a creative endeavor, but it's not the only one for sure. I think all of us have the potential to be creative. <laughs> um, and I wanted to answer the other thing about emotion. I noticed we were speaking about grief earlier and about pain and about all this suffering that we know that animals are going through. And then part part of the other part was trying to look at the hopeful, the hope, right? And, and, and at sanctuaries. And I think... Uh, I think this this is something that's been building in the last years, maybe in the last decades, right? With exactly with the move uh, with with the movement of sanctuaries that start to give maybe this small glimmer of hope that we can have better relationships, kinder kinder multi-species relationships, and take into account other animals. Um, so I think we really. I don't think there's anything that we do without emotions. I don't think there's like coming from, from a feminist standpoint, I don't think that we have, you know, thought here and emotion there and we can do one without the other. But sometimes we speak as if they were separate also because it's easier to, to categorize things, right? But I, I think there's emotion in all that we do. And for example, as such as wondering, because we try to explain theoretical concepts that sometimes are a bit difficult. We really um, use the, the visual and the, and the voice to convey, you know, uh, to sort of ground it in an invalid experience. And with the whole choice of the, the color palette and the boot, we try to use all of these things um, also with the, with the narration or the examples that we we try to give. So, for example, we have one of one of our essays about uh, uh, Sue Donaldson and Will Kinnerka's book, uh, The Political Theory of Animal Rights, about zoopolis. At the end, we have a really short story that's maybe three minutes or four minutes that is actually envisioning the theory, the theoretical part that that we have mm -hmm. at the at the beginning. So, this is. Always trying to bring these two together consciously. I know they are together, but there's the work in trying to also make, uh, do it, do it consciously. Oh, sorry, Kyle, have you got a question? Well, there's a comment from YouTube uh, and a question from Philip. First, my sincere thanks to everyone. I have learned so much. Second, following Anya's question, do the artists struggle with feelings of misanthropy? If so, how do they deal with that? I don't, I don't hate humans. Um, I, I get frustrated by humans quite a bit. And, um, uh, especially thinking about the animal shelter, I, um, when I first started volunteering there, I would get really angry at people being like, oh, can't you see what's happening? You know, don't you, you know, you just want to like look away and not think about it. But then the more I started thinking about it, I was like, you know, everybody makes mistakes, you know, and everybody messes up in their life, you know, and, and, I, I don't know anybody who hasn't done something that they don't regret. And I, I'm not a perfect person. People are completely imperfect. And when you keep making the same mistake over and over and over, then I feel like we can go ahead and get judgmental and <laughs> and I can have opinions and stuff. But I, I kind of feel like, you know, one, one thing that we can all do better is just to have compassion for each other, you know, and to realize that we are imperfect people living in an imperfect world. So... Yeah. Um, I don't hate humans, but I do think we can do better, but I can do better. So to follow up, Gordon on uh, YouTube says, thank you to all amazing artists and activists for your inspiring and important work. 
is deeply appreciated. And I think you might have just answered this, but everybody else can chime in. Have you experienced direct resistance to your work? I hope it is always well received. Good question. I'll jump in on that. <laughs> um, I think we probably all have. Um, it's the nature of the of the game, huh? Um, but yeah, uh, something that's been really interesting. Well, there there have been some negative reviews and positive reviews of my book, and one of them um, I thought was really interesting because the person that posted a negative review it's um it was mostly vegan saying yes on goodreads and there was one negative review that um was asserting that having names for animals as um the poster was kind of referring to uh a well-known kind of celebrity dairy farmer that's on youtube um who likes to outline how he's benign and um he knows my, all the names of his cows blah, blah blah but it's it's an actually it's a pretty large farm and i don't think that's actually possible i think he's got hundreds of cows in his dairy herd um but this poster was saying something about um the fact that the names are known it's just kind of absolving this farmer of you know non-individuality and that farm all farmers you know might not be as caring but there are some farmers that do see them as individuals and name is the naming them as the proof. And, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's just kind of coming to terms with the fact that there's so many layers to this, um, as artists and as people that are trying to help people see the next layer of, um, reality. <laughs> so it's like, you have to kind of like, I don't know, I'm just like spinning off into tangents, but, um, seeing that seeing that negative feedback was just um, it's education for me to understand where people are at mentally and um, what I can do to clarify further um, my activism and my work for children and for audiences, I guess. Uh, so instead of taking it personally, instead of taking the negative feedback personally, thinking about how the um, the it was received and what kind of mentality was receiving it and how I might be able to more broadly uncover why naming a cow isn't enough. Um, if if that makes any sense. Anyway, mm -hmm. thanks for the question. I'm sure everyone has really awesome ideas. Ava, Marie. Well, Ava, Marie. I just want to say that yeah, I, I just want to say that I don't really have gotten like bad reviews or bad criticism, but I am, I just know that there are so many situations that I go, don't get invited to uh, because of me being too radical, because people know that I will ask them to go vegan and I will point to their material and and uh, if a museum invites me, I ask the restaurant to go vegan for a day. You know, I'm like completely doing that in e all the emails that I ever and all the contact I ever have with all the institutions. I ask, all right, if you invite me, what do you serve? <laughs> you can't serve that. You need to serve something else. And what other artists are there? And I, I just know that. That is what happens to me, at least, that I know that I don't get invited to things, to exhibitions, talks, uh, because uh, I'm just like, I'm bringing in the bad weather. <laughs> uh, but I know I'm also invited because I bring in the bad weather, you know? So yeah. I don't know. It's just like, I just need to be true to myself. And I know what, what, like, what my aim is. So, yeah, yeah. that's my, my view on this. Mm. Wonderful. Can I just uh sorry yes. just one second. I I I I totally feel what uh, Eva Marie is saying because I also feel like sometimes our work does not fit in places because it's so hybrid and it's so anti specist and it's too political. I also wanted to say that I'm in Romania I'm also part of the queer vegan community. And we have a, a, this word that we use for what you just mentioned, the feeling. It's like from, from Sana Ahmed, Samini's killjoy, but we say vegan killjoy. Right. So vegan killjoys. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. I write about the Vivian Kilgore in my PSD. Yeah. Like, yeah. In it's my next band. People around. Sonesco <laughs> 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 and Twine, for example, write about the Vivian Kilgore. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Michelle, did you want, were you, did you hit your hand? Yeah. Yeah, I do have something to say. Um, well, a couple things now. Um, regarding misanthropy, um, I have definitely gone through phases of that. It's really hard um, to not. Like you see what he would do to animals. And for me, um, I'm involved in cat rescue. And this summer have been working on TNR. And anyone who doesn't know what that is, it trapped mm -hmm. me to return her cat. Um, and have been working on on rescuing cats from an absolutely horrific situation. And, you know, what I've really come to is that there's some really different levels of awareness with humans. And I, I, there's, there's so many really wonderful people who are very aware. And then there's the ones who are not or who don't care. And those of them who do care end up cleaning up the methods that they make. Um, I have, huge respect for everybody who's involved in animal rescue and such hard work. Um, so that definitely covered colors my position, my perception of, of, you know, this issue. Um, and then, um, you know, something, something else is that I know that I also don't get invited <laughs> to participate in them because of, <laughs> you know, because of my outdoorsiveness. I mean, for sure, like that definitely a thing. Um, and I, I'm kind of, I'm in an interesting place, I guess, cause I kind of straddle, like I'm in a commercial gallery, so I do that, but then I'm also doing activist art. So I try to juggle both. I'm not always successful. Um, definitely not always successful, but, but I try and do both cause I feel like there's value in both, um, realms for me. I, I, I love, uh, what you, what you just said about, about, um, misanthropy. And, and I think that there's often a negative, uh, connotation with the misanthrope. I'm a very, I'm very, very much a proud <laughs> misanthrope. Um, and, um, uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this because, because it is, it is, um, perceived negatively. Um, and I think a lot about the idea of hope in this concept, um, and there's a, a wonderful uh, professor, uh, Chelsea Wadigo, who is a, an Indigenous academic in Australia, um, speaks about hope in terms of indigeneity and her title of one of her essays is Fuck Hope. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, th I think about this um, because it, it, I think it's a very inter it's interesting to, uh, in this time when we're supposed to have hope. Um, you know, where uh, it's, it's very seen, you know, as a very, very negative thing if you don't have hope. Um, but hope to me is great to have. I'm sure that I have it in my body <laughs> and I use the word. But to me, it's actually more about love. I realise I don't actually have much hope for the world and I don't have any hope for for my species. Um, I think we're, we're really terrible. But I do have love and love is, is a more interesting concept to me because love is about relationships and we are in a relationship with the world that we're in. We're, not, we're in a relationship with the species that we share this planet with. We are in a relationship with the ecological world and relationships um, uh, are, are really hard. Uh, as, as Robin was saying earlier, we make mistakes <laughs> in relationships. Um, we 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 uh, we mess up. We we try and we fail. But but if we see ourselves in a constant communication and a constant dialogue and in in a, a loving relationship with uh, with everybody else, including including other animals, I think that's a more productive way to be in this world. And and so I'm just operating on on a platform of boundless love <laughs> and and knowing that I will fail in that love but but keep on trying I'm committed to this relationship with this world <laughs> there are a few more uh questions comments from YouTube here Susan says such a heart rendering inspirational session I'm wondering if anyone would like to talk about their decision 
to offer artwork as advocacy in terms of what we do with our bodies to create a vegan future? Not quite. Uh, I'm a little bit confused about the last part of that. Yeah, Susan, maybe, maybe you like could re-explain. Consumption. Yeah, maybe if you write back, Susan, to uh, um, clarify that a bit. Yeah. There's yeah. another one from Gordon. How do you balance the depiction of harsh realities of animal cruelty and art without desensitizing or overwhelming the audience? I think about that a lot about um, when you present something that is really graphic and violent and um, people have a tendency to shut down and they um, want to disengage. And I think a lot about, um, it's kind of like Laura was talking about with the, with love, like how do you have use an aesthetic that's going to make people care deeply and want to be involved? I actually think that's a much more powerful um, way of getting people involved is instead of like guilt and shame, but using you know love and compassion as a um, you know a message. So to say like not because you feel sorry for this particular animal um, that you want to make a change, but because you it think that this other life is absolutely phenomenal, you know, and, and as precious as your own, that you want to make a change. So I actually feel like that that's a more powerful motivator, um, I found anyway, with my own work. I agree. Although that doesn't stop me from, um, it kind of, somebody else said this, it's like a hot and cold pack. Like you, you have to show what this <laughs> being is experiencing in order to uh, you can't, it can't all just be like, oh, then the world is lovely and unhappy. Yes. Just do it. <laughs> Not that anybody was saying that, but I'm oversimplifying. I'm going to stop talking, rambling. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else interested in answering that question? Um, I, I'll just kind of make a, you know, it's kind of a stab at it. Um, And I kind of said it before. I mean, I think those two things of course exist in life as it is for the universe i mean that's just the way things are there's life and growth and darkness and death and you know are are they really such a dichotomy i, I you know i i personally think they're part of the same thing um and i and i i was a little worried about the book um being sort of too hopeful or too positive um because <laughs> you know i'm not really a like i'm hopeful but i'm not such a positive person and also i think there's so much to do and there's so much to worry about and there's so many problems that i didn't want to you know, have people pick up the book and say, oh, this is great. You know, this is great. Animals are creative. We don't have to worry about them or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I I think you just, you have to go with what things are. And they are um, uh, two sides of everything or, or multi-sided. And you try to deal with that as an artist. Um you know, you didn't see Tolstoy sort of just talk about the nice things about about, about the Russian wars and Napoleon. I mean, he just, it was everything. So I, I think if people are going to look at art and read books, they need to be open to that. Otherwise, you know, they should just look at sitcoms. <laughs> That's so funny you say that, Carol, because I, um, I love the, um, I love teaching provocative stuff, because I do actually think it changes people, um, because they can't. It's like that thing of once you know something, you can't unknow it, and right, um, and I don't just teach that. I don't just show art that's provocative, but even if it's not art, say it's well, it could be a form of art, but like a documentary. Um, showing it, explo exploitation, some graphic imagery, um, raising awareness of things they just don't know about. This is the way that I became vegan through um, watching a animal activist article um, video on what happens in the egg industry. I had no idea, 
and I wouldn't have sought that out myself. But I went along to a meeting and they it was just a public meeting and they showed that and that was it. As soon as I saw that, that was it. Now, that's not the process for everyone, but it can be the process for some people. So I'm very much in favour. I'm actually what you would call not hopeful and a pessimist. So I'm not the person you want to invite to dinner. <laughs> but um, I do... Um, <laughs> I do, like having said that, it's not fair because I do appreciate humour and it's really a shame that Yvette Watt's not here today because Yvette's art has inspired me tremendously because she uses humour in her activist art on behalf of animals and I found that that is another way that really works for my classes and going in through humour. So big shout out to Yvette. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, I'll stop talking. I can hear Carl. Yeah, we, we have a clarification yeah, from Susan on her yeah. question. She okay. says, yeah, she says, well, sometimes I think I should be picketing instead of scribbling. Guess I'm seeking absolution. But now, riffing off Laura, maybe it's a form of love. Okay, that's a good clarification. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> it's much nicer. Can I just say a comment to that? I mean, I, I completely feel uh, that uh, that comment. <laughs> Maybe I instead should pick a thing or do something more activist-like. But I mean, if we need to do everything <laughs> over the complete. Like we need to do everything, or we need to be in all layers. Speaking about these uh, atrocities and the change that we want to see. Uh, so. I do this because I'm good at it. And someone is really good at something else and they need to do what they need to do, you know. Uh, and it took me a couple of years to uh, to have the courage to bring the animal issue within my art. I had this idea as a young artist that there was not room for animal activism within the art system. And now uh, I can see that there is. So... I mean, I really need to do what I'm good at. That's the the way that I can be most effective, I think. Mm. It's a fabulous answer. Um, I'm just, uh, are there any more um, comments or questions coming through, Carl? Nope, I think that's it. No. Okay, so I'm noticing the time, and for some of you it's very late. Um, and we've been going for about two, nearly two and a half hours. So <laughs> I'm going to... Um, and I'm going to wrap it up, but I'm going to wrap it up in a a long way. <laughs> so we're not finishing quite yet. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I want to just bring animals into this. So this is like, okay, this is Aruka Animal International is all about art, you know, the arts and how the arts can help with all these questions about um Animal about human exceptionalism and speciesism and animal exploitation. So what I want to ask as a final question of all the panellists to bring animals back in is what animals have you known personally, um, and these don't need to be your companion animals, it could be wild animals that have inspired you or other animals, but what animals have you known personally who have inspired your art, and please just give a brief, like a little biography about that animal and why they inspired your art, or those animals. Okay, I'll just say this quickly. It's in the book, and it was a very um, monumental experience for me. I was... Um, all you know, still very involved with with uh, not really an animal activist, but I was really thinking quite a bit about this. I wasn't eating meat, etc. And um, on my twenty first birthday, friends took me in college to the zoo because they knew I liked animals. And at that point, I wasn't really, um, you know, smart enough to realize. At after this, I was, but you know that zoos aren't good places. Um, and I, I saw an orangutan for the first time in my life, never seen anything like an orangutan. Now, this is many, many, many years ago, you have to understand. And, um, and he was just sort of had his hands around the, the bar 
And he was just looking out at everyone with this really profound look of sadness. At least I felt that was it. And we just stared at each other. And I know that primates, gorillas, for instance, you're not supposed to look at the males because, you know, they think you're that's more like a, a you know, not, well, you shouldn't because they think you are trying to be dominant. But the orangutan and I just looked at each other, and I don't know how long, but I, and I had seen this in other animals, but what I saw in his eyes was just this incredible wisdom. And, you know, he had given up, but at the same time, he was just sort of judging. And um, and I don't know how long I was there, but but I, and I don't know how I left, but I did. And finally, and it, that really had an effect. Um, there was no doubt in my mind, if there was any doubt before. Gosh, these stories are going to be extremely sad, some of them, aren't they? I didn't anticipate that, but that's very poignant. Thank you, Carol. I did sort of anticipate it, but I also kind of didn't. But um, who would like – Laura, would you like to go next because you are next coming around? Yeah, I'd like to – I'd like to honour the mosquito. Uh, in 2012, I was I met a, a tiger mosquito who who bit me um, and and gave me um, a gift, <laughs> which wasn't a great gift. It was chikungunya, which is a um, a dengue like illness, and it it ravaged my body for about two years. But it made me it helped me to understand the power of the insect world. This tiny, tiny little creature had had transferred part of herself through her saliva and and it changed my body and my understanding of of interspecies communication forever um it is because of her that um that the animals in that country a novel about interspecies communication is what it is and i i just like to think of and thank insects especially wow. mosquitoes wow that's amazing amazing yeah. to think a mosquito inspired your book. I love it. Maria? Yes, I'm still wrapping my head around everything we've been saying. I just wanted to just shortly say that uh, I found it interesting that we talk so much about hope and that actually I think of myself as a, as a hopeful pessimist and I, I cling to hope not because I really hope, uh, not because I believe something is possible, but because I feel that we should fight for it, whether or not it is possible. Um, and with the question about particular animals, I think, I think uh, the three of us are just wondering, really, have, because we all work for, from home, all our work days are really filled with the companion animals from our lives, so. Together with the three of us, we have so uh, the cats, Arya, um, Wormwood, and Robin, and then we have the dogs, Aki and Nuna, and they really reshaped um, the way we do things, and even much so so much of uh, what we create. So, for example, uh, our dogs, Aki and Nuna, made the uh, Aaron Noor, the the, res the researcher and director of our collective start. Um, a specific research on street dogs and also my poetry book that came out this year is filled with poems about living with them. And they really make us think much more deeply uh, about what is possible uh, in, a, in a, because we have this multi-species household and we really take, we, we try to take their desires seriously. Um, and I think that's also why sanctuaries are so important because they they make spaces in which these relationships happen. And only when these relationships, the multi-species respectful relationships happen, can we understand what they mean and can we ask ourselves what would it be like if animals were liberated? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, Michelle. For me, you know, uh, well, growing up, we always had cats. And in a lot of ways, I can relate to them more than 
than the humans in our family. Um, grew up in a pretty tumultuous environment. Um, but the other thing for me is that my grandmother, um, who was um, from Eastern Europe and um, an anarchist um, and an activist for humans, um, was also vegetarian. And in her circle, um, all of, all of her community friends, you know, the friends were all vegetarian. They weren't vegan. Um, unfortunately, she died before I even knew what a vegan was. But um, I think that she definitely, you know, had a lot of influence on me. Um, just you know, taking that stance, and uh, I didn't I didn't stop eating um, animal until I was seventeen, and I didn't go vegan until a few years later after that. Okay. Um, well, I'm sort of moving around my screen. And next is a um, Shannon. I I think I already mentioned um, my uh, my friend Lula, who um, I got to live with for about 13 years. Um, but I, she really changed me. Um, She's just a very earnest soul who didn't care at all what other people thought of her, and I. Um, loved living with her um and um we thankfully had a whole um pack of uh animals that i got to live with for a while so i um feel lucky to have been part of that group i don't think i just answered your question (laughs) but that was that was one um that was one creature who changed my life Uh, that well that's awesome and and no doubt inspired your your commitment to animal activism and art. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. And now, Julia. Yeah, um, I have to honor my companion over across the room, Cave. Um, he is uh, a rescue from Salem, Massachusetts. He came up with his litter from Georgia. Um, and he teaches me how... He teaches me every day that humans are not the center of the story. <laughs> and I love that so much about him. He is, I don't even want to say this because it, it drives me crazy when people say good boy, bad boy, whatever. Um, he's hes his own self. <laughs> he's exactly perfect because of that. Um, he's very clear about his boundaries and his space. And I find that kind of remarkable um, because he... I think people often believe that they presume that they can be a certain way with all dogs, period, in cave. Um, while he's not bitten anyone yet, he's very clear about this is my space and I don't, until I know and trust you, um, let's keep it uh, respectful and cool. <laughs> and that aspect of him has been really incredible and I just honor that about him. And I learned so much from him because of that. Uh, I think he's so cool exactly how he is. And I love Cave. Best dog. No, I, I love all the dogs are the best I love dogs. I these stories. <laughs> of course they are. I'm yeah. loving hearing all these stories. It's fabulous. Ava Marie. Yes. Uh, I actually want to write and read a really short text for you. It's it's not long. It takes maybe two minutes, and it's it's from the thesis that you showed Annie in the beginning, and it's about my dog friend Adela. The first time I met my dog friend Adela, she was three years old and came strutting down the sidewalk of my house. She came with her family, and when they left, she belonged to another family me and my husband. I remember how we looked at each other, frightened but excited. We were now responsible for this living being, and we couldn't understand that someone actually thought we were able of taking on such a responsibility. It took a while for me and Della to develop our relationship, and after a few months with her in my life, I had an epiphany. I knew nothing about other animals. If I could create such a strong bond with a dog, if I could recognize fear, affection, stress, desire, hunger, irritation, joy, 
longing, and many other emotions in her that I didn't think was capable of. Then I probably didn't know anything about other animals. If I was shocked by her ability to think, plan, manipulate, and keep track of time, it was because I had underestimated her, and probably many others like her. I was shaken to the core by her clear will and integrity. I no longer could trust the way I had viewed the non-humans with whom I shared this earth. I had been taught that the inner lives, communication skills, and willpower of humans were superior to other animals, that the species barrier was impossible to bridge, that what I saw in them was just myself. I wasn't prepared for the mutual relationship that was ours. My love for her became so strong it made me frightened. Everything in the world was a threat. Other dogs, cars, humans and their laws. The love I felt, the relationship I had with her, was supposed to be impossible. Everything I knew about other animals had to be renegotiated and re-evaluated. I knew nothing. Wow. Wow. That's a fantastic, fantastic youth. <laughs> yes, so I love yeah, I'm Stella so and she really changed my life. Uh, she really changed my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a wonderful way for us, I think, to close this too, um, Ava Marie. That's brought tears to all our eyes, I think. <laughs> a, a beautiful tribute to Della, who I, I'm very happy to have met many years ago. Um, so just in finishing, I, I just want to thank, of course, our panellists here because they're um, inspirational, all of them in their own ways. Um, and uh, I'd also like to encourage you to go and look at their websites. They all have individual websites so you can learn more about their work. Um, and I also want to ask you please to sign up uh, for the Aruka International Animal International Newsletter, which will give you more information about um, Aruka and what it does, and also um, will let you know about any um, upcoming events like this one. Um, and you can also join the Aruka Animal International um, Instagram to get regular posts as well. I want to thank Robin again for organising all of this, um, and Carl for the, being a fabulous producer. And, um, yeah, let's go about our day to day and just, um, just admire the world and all of the animals and all of their amazing magical differences. Um, and let's be kind. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you again to the wonderful artists. Bye bye. you meant to